So a fun thing happened. I got my first contentious comment. But what makes this an extra special occasion is the backstory behind this comment and the person who I think actually wrote it. Now, the person who left the comment is supposedly called Peter Opus, but I don't think that's who really wrote the comment. Now, I'm not gonna come out right and say that the person who I think made the comment is a craven, generic thinking, intellectual lightweight whose only response to me in private was to dismiss me as a troll, virtue signal his intentions rather than back up his arguments, then cowardly create a fake YouTube profile just to contend with me in public. I won't do that, but I'll let you be the judge. Now, if you haven't seen my most recent video, Polynesian Lives Matter, hashtag PLM, greater than hashtag BLM, in it, I only contend with one specific person, namely, and that's Sonny Ganadin. Soon after posting the video, Mr. Sonny Ganadanedede, and I had a very brief message exchange on Facebook, and I think it's safe to say that it didn't go well. It ended with him blocking me. But not a half hour after our brief exchange, I got this comment on the video. Now, I understand that this can be completely coincidental, that not a half hour after I hear from Sonny Ganadin about the video where I shit-talk Sonny Ganadin, that I get a comment on the video of me shit-talking Sonny Ganadin. And of course, the comment is mostly defending the views of Sonny Ganadin. But I am willing to admit that there is a slight possibility that it's not Sonny Ganadin. But what is evident, at the very least, is that Sonny Ganadin sent one of his shooters to get me. And by shooter, I just mean bitch. Bitch tits. That's right. He sent one of his bitch tits to dismantle my video, to wreck my points. And of course, he put up such a good argument that he backed it up with zero evidence. <laughs> <laughs> if you couldn't tell already, the purpose of this video is to address some of the counter arguments that were given uh, in this bit of fan mail. Now, if I responded to every single sentence in this comment, this video would be an hour fucking long. So instead, I'm just going to address the main points that were given. But if you want to read his full comment, it's, it'll be highlighted in the comment section of my video, Polynesian Lives Matter. So let's jump right in. He says... Oh, how I wish we could reduce human lives, culture, behavior, and history to logic and statistics. Good on you for trying, but you can't. So the first accusation is that I relied too heavily on statistics and logic. This is a strange lapse of reasoning because, well, first, that's not what I was attempting to do. I wasn't using statistics and logic to oversimplify the human experience. I was using statistics to directly counter your assertions on inequity in the justice system. But it does make sense that you would resent that practice because the statistics aren't on your side. But you don't get to just throw the baby out with the bathwater and claim that the statistics and evidence are irrelevant just because you don't like them. I mean, no matter the subject being debated, we should rely on the best evidence every time. But let me give an example. Let's say I make the claim that Troy Polamalu is the best safety to ever play the game. Then someone walks up and disputes my claim and says, no, 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 Ed Reed was the best. Well, in the ensuing debate that would follow, both of us will be helpless but to turn to the statistics in order to best plead our cases. I would say something like, well, Polamalu wins on tackles, sacks, forced fumbles, and Super Bowl rings. And not only that, but he did it in 21 fewer games than Ed Reed. Other guy would counter and say, yeah, well, Reed wins on interceptions, touchdowns, Pro Bowls, and all pro selections. And then from there, we would use logic to interpret these statistics to strengthen our claims. Well, Sonny here isn't even playing within those boundaries. What he's doing is walking up to me and the other guy and saying, no, 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 you're both wrong. Best safety, hands down, hands down is Malcolm Butler. We say, uh, who's that? He says, it's the guy who made the game-winning interception for the Patriots in Super Bowl 49. Both of us be like, well, dude, his stats don't even come close to either Polamalu or Ed Reed. 
But then Sonny says, no, 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 no. See, this is the problem. You guys are relying too much on those useless statistics and logic. All right. You can't reduce gameplay effectiveness or playmaking ability or field awareness. You can't reduce those down to statistics and logic. All right. Tell me how many times Ed Reed or Polamalu made clutch game winning interceptions in a Super Bowl. Huh? Oh, zero times. Yeah, didn't think so. See, this is an ineffective way in trying to settle this extremely simple matter of who the best safety is, which is Troy Polamalu. And it's equally ineffective at solving the infinitely more complex issue of why Polynesians are getting locked up in Hawaii. The facts matter. But okay, let's move on. In his next criticism, he says, statistics have to be put into context to be meaningfully interpreted. So according to Sonny, uh, sorry, I mean, Peter Not only did I rely too much on useless statistics, but I also used them out of context. Well, okay, Mr. Not Sonny Gannadin, allow me to put the statistics into context for you as simply as I possibly can, because clearly this logic shit is a little too difficult for you. But let's go back to the initial clip I used. Um, So, Sonny, why should we care specifically about having too many Hawaiians in prison? Well, what should we care as non-Hawaiians? Like, so, I mean, the historical rhetoric is that we shouldn't care, that um, this is a part of America and that we have equality in the court systems. And um, if you are found guilty of a crime, you do the time. Right. Um, When you look at the numbers, it just doesn't bear out like that. We have significant amounts of social inequality, what we would colloquially call racism. That means the overrepresentation of indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system at every level. So there's a few main things we need to break down. First is his definition of what equality in the justice system looks like. And he defined it as if you do the crime, you do the time. Now, here's the flip side. If that's what equality in the justice system looks like, then inequality, conversely, would mean that either you do the crime, but you're not doing the time, or you don't do the crime, and you're doing the time. It seems to me that Sonny is arguing the latter point. Now, these are parameters I'm operating by that were clearly defined and used by Sonny Gannadin himself. Now, this is where those oppressive statistics come in, is because he made the fact claim that if you look at the numbers, they do not represent a just justice system. All we have to do is see whether or not Polynesians are not committing the crime, but still doing the time. And this is how we can determine whether or not we are dealing with an unjust justice system. God, now if only there was a way that we could check those numbers. If only there was an entity out there who researched to find these numbers. Oh wait, an entity out there like the research and statistics branch of the Attorney General's office in Hawaii who posted these numbers. Now, are you ready for these racist facts? I'm just going to pull a clip from the old video because I'm too lazy to re-edit a whole bit. Polynesians make up about 23% of the population in Hawaii, but about half of the prison inmates. Why is that? Well, according to the Research and Statistics Branch of the Attorney General's Office in Hawaii, Polynesians commit 47% of the murders, 50% of the robberies, 42% of the burglaries, 35% of the rapes, 57% of the motor vehicle thefts, and 45% of all assaults. And of those percentages of Polynesians... Native Hawaiians specifically make up the vast majority of those offenders. And things aren't getting better with our youth. Of all juvenile crime reports, Polynesian youth commit 100% of the murders, 43% of the rapes, 49% of burglaries, 70% of robberies, and 55% of assaults, and 48% of vehicle thefts. Now, does it not make sense that despite our low number in the general population of Hawaii, if we're committing on average about half of all felony offenses in the state, that we'd make up about half of the fucking prison population? So... 
to put these numbers into context for you, bud, what I was doing is demonstrating that Polynesians are indeed committing the crime, hence doing the time. And they're committing these crimes in a comically disproportionate number. And not only that, but at a rate completely proportionate to the incarceration rate. So by your own definition of what equality in the justice system looks like, the statistics refute your claims. Friendly bit of advice, Sonny. Never bring the numbers up again if you want to keep even a shred of credibility. But I know why the statistics really don't actually matter to you, and that's because in your flawed and condescending characterization of Pacific Islanders, you leave out one human trait, and that's personal accountability. Because the second you stop infantilizing Pacific Islanders and admit that they're complicit in their own incarceration, your narrative falls apart. So in order to avoid the concept of personal accountability, you just blame everything on colonialism and the inherent racism that's supposedly built into the system. Let's look at a clip from the same interview. What we do when we ship prisoners to Arizona, if they commit a crime such as murder of another inmate inside the prison, we've just subjected them and exposed them to the death penalty and the laws of Arizona. There's an actual case that's going on right now that's dealing with this from an inmate who was killed over there, Hawaiian inmate was transferred, killed another inmate, and now he's going through um, litigation um, trying to stay out of the death penalty, but he's subject to it because of their laws. Well, it's the wretched situation leading to like wretched consequences. Right. So this is one of many horrific stories that has come out of the relationship that Hawaii entered into with private contractors to house human beings. Yep. It could be the wretched situation leading to wretched consequences or it could be because of the wretched decision-making by an individual against another individual and who is now being held accountable for his voluntary actions. Just to give some context to this story, a Hawaiian inmate in Arizona stabbed another Hawaiian inmate over 140 times and then carved the gang initials into his chest. Something that Sonny Ganadin doesn't seem to understand is that this guy is not in the circumstances he's in because of a deal between the Hawaiian government and private prisons. He's in this circumstance because of his actions. And we can't even get an acknowledgement of that from Mr. Sonny Ganadin here, even when this motherfucker stabs someone 140 times. And somehow this is the result of a deal between the state and prisons. Fuck personal accountability. This is all the white man's fault. So instead of personal accountability, Mr. Not Sonny Ganadin offers up two different explanations as to why so many Polynesians are getting locked up. He says, what you're not accounting for are the higher levels of enforcement in poorer communities that are largely made up of Hawaiian Samoans and other Pacific Islanders. That and the fact that many of Hawaii's prisoners are shipped out to private prisons in the lower 48 that are contracted to house prisoners by the state of Hawaii. What I'm saying is that the state has already paid for the beds. Where do you think the state gets the bodies to fill those beds so that the taxpayers' monies on contracts isn't wasted? Not from the affluent white and Asian communities in Hawaii. So in other words, it's over-policing. There are just too many cops out there and Pacific Islander communities just rounding people up like cattle and herding them on into the prisons. Actually, where have I heard this argument before? Oh, that's right. You know, we're going into a discussion that also talks about um, the over-policing of some of these communities. So... But yeah, it's totally not Sonny Gannadin who left this comment. So do you want to know why there's stronger enforcement in the poor communities? It's because there are more violent criminals in those communities and you need more police officers to protect the law-abiding citizens from those criminals. And you also want to know why the prisons aren't being filled with the populace of the affluent white and Asian communities? It's because those communities are made up of less criminals. You dumbass. But regardless, 
this claim isn't only baseless and idiotic, but it's also insulting to every single police officer and judge in Hawaii. Every single person in prison had a trial, conviction, or a plea deal. So for you to make the claim that over-policing plays a primary role in this, you're insisting that by default, judges and police officers are colluding together to bypass the due process of only Pacific Islanders and that this is purely motivated by money. This is patently insane and insulting for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which is that a majority of the police officers in Hawaii are Pacific Islanders. And apparently, according to you, they're just racist against their own people. It's either that or you're insinuating that if we police more in the affluent communities, that the racial imbalance of the prisons will even itself because there are just as many criminals in these areas. There is literally no evidence to support that claim. In fact, a quick look at the number of victims of violent crime in these areas points to the contrary. So again, you have nothing. And in the words of the late great Christopher Hitchens, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So let's just go back to your assertions of discriminatory over-policing, and we'll go back to your comment. You say, go back and look at the crime statistics you cite. The violent crimes you point to make up a fraction of the number and kinds of arrests made. There were far more property and drug arrests than arrests for violent crime. Well, okay, so what? We're talking about the crimes people are being incarcerated for, not merely arrested. You can get arrested for shoplifting, but serve no prison sentence. But I will accept your challenge and go through the numbers again to see if Pacific Islanders are going to jail for petty crimes. According to the Department of Public Safety's most recent headcount report, there are currently 3,527 inmates on the island and 1,600 on the mainland. Now, let's return to Sonny's definition of what a just justice system looks like. If you do the crime, you do the time. So hopefully, we can agree that there are people in these prisons who deserve to be in the prison. Let's start with felony offenses. Can we agree on that? If you committed a felony, you might justifiably be in jail. Okay, well, of the head count, there are 3,556 felons incarcerated. That's about 70% of the entire prison population. Now, the next group of people are the parole and probation violators. In the report, this pe these people aren't differentiated between felons and misdemeanor offenders, but definitionally, they're repeat offenders if they're violating probation and parole because they've been found guilty of a crime in the past. I'm also not just making an assumption here because there was a study done by the University of Hawaii at Manoa with the Department of the Attorney General of Hawaii a few years ago, and it's called Hawaii's Imprisonment Policy and the Performance of Parolees Who Were Incarcerated in State and on the Mainland. It's a long study name, but in the study, they found that the average parolee being released, released from prison, averaged 56 arrests and 24 convictions, including an average of 20 felony arrests and 8 felony convictions per parolee. So I'll throw in parole and probation violators into the did the crime, do the time category, which boosts us up to 94% of the prison population at about 4,810 prison inmates. Again, this is the incarceration rate of felony offenders and repeat offenders only. Now, let's take a look at the number of murder, rapes, robberies, aggravated assaults, burglaries, larcenies, vehicle thefts, and arson crime numbers alone. Oh, it's 4,885, and that was in 2016 alone. I don't know how you're making the idiotic claims you're making with a straight face when the arrest numbers for these eight crimes alone over the course of only one year is enough to account for more than 95% of all prison inmates in Hawaii, including the ones on the mainland. So where is the evidence of petty crime being punished with incarceration? Where is the evidence 
of discrimination or wrongdoing on the part of the justice system. So your little factoid you refer to that most arrests made are for minor property and drug offenses is useless. It means nothing. Talk about a lack of fucking context. In fact, it perfectly explains how Hawaii ends up with a justice system that looks like this, where the vast, vast majority of criminals aren't even being locked up and are on parole or probation because the justice system doesn't have time for the petty crimes. So your non-argument that the justice system needs to feed itself by going out and arresting Pacific Islanders is not substantiated in any way, shape, or form. Polynesian criminals, if anything, are seemingly feeding themselves to the justice system at a rate that you guys can't even handle. Your worldview on this issue couldn't be more fucking wrong if you tried. Because the narrative you're trying to push, that there's a massive prison industrial complex ran by evil white men who need to make money by filling the prisons, and to fill these prisons, they're going around picking on poor, lowly Pacific Islanders because they have no power. This is an unoriginal conspiracy theory narrative with zero evidence to back any of it. But the reason I despise your narrative isn't even because it's factually incorrect. It's because the entire cornerstone of your narrative rests upon getting Pacific Islanders to believe the cancerous lie that they have no power. Your entire narrative relies on getting Pacific Islanders to believe their own victimhood and lack of power so that you can come around and sell them the solution, which is big government. And conveniently, you just ran for government, didn't you? But by definition, what you're pushing is disempowerment. And what's worse is that you're pushing this crippling idea of disempowerment under the guise of empowerment. I mean, I hope you'll clarify, but I just don't see where the empowerment comes in when you're telling our Polynesian youth that no matter what they do, no matter what decisions they make, there's a big bad criminal justice system out there that's out to get them for no other reason than their skin color. And that their only defense against this big bad evil justice system is to vote ideologues like you into office. So again, forgive me for not being able to see exactly where the empowerment comes in. Because I would think true empowerment would be telling our Polynesian youth that they are the first line defense. That they have the power to stay out of the criminal justice system. Which they do. So you can mock the idea of personal accountability and the idea that Pacific Islanders have the power to control their own destiny and through their own voluntary actions stay out of prison. You mock this concept by seemingly just making fun of how I talk, I assume, and it's not even close, I don't think. You say, the reason they so many Polynesians in prisons cause they's doing all the crimes. That's a little racist against black people, wouldn't you say? But yes, with that idea that Pacific Islanders are committing the crimes, hence getting locked up, comes the basic concept that Pacific Islanders not only have the power to put themselves in prison, but to keep themselves out. Despite your insults, there are truisms surrounding the concept that the best medium of safeguarding the well-being of an individual lies with the individual. I'll let Tito explain the applicable one here. I believe it was an ancient Hawaiian who said, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. It's that simple. I'll give another one. How about look both ways before you cross the road? Because we could change as many laws as we want to best protect pedestrians, right? We give them the right of way. We, we create crosswalks. I live right by a university and the speed limit drops way low when you're next to it. And there's crosswalks every 10 yards, it seems like. And of course, this is all to protect the pedestrian. And we could just keep enacting more and more laws all the way down to just short of banning vehicles from roads entirely. But all of those laws will be negated and won't meet their intended purpose if you fail to meet the minimum obligation that you have to yourself 
and the other people on the road to safeguard your own well-being by looking both ways before you cross. Because if you just dart out into the road without being aware of your surroundings and get hit by a car, then you bear some level of accountability for your own demise. And the same thing applies to incarceration, right? We could change as many external factors as we wanted. We could crack down on police and judges. We could force everyone to take implicit bias training. We could lower standards for Pacific Islanders, but none of it would matter because it is all negated the second a Pacific Islander commits a crime. And if there's a preponderance of Pacific Islanders committing crimes, which there is, you're gonna see more Pacific Islanders Islanders in prison. Just like if hypothetically there were more Pacific Islanders crossing the road while texting, there'd probably be more of us getting hit by cars. And if it were the case that Pacific Islanders were disproportionately getting hit by cars, it wouldn't constitute as evidence of racism within the transit system. The exact same way that the disproportionate number of Pacific Islanders in prison is not evidence of racism within the justice system. These things are more nuanced than that. But Sonny Gannadin is operating on the framework that there is no internal locus of control. All locus of control is external in his worldview. So in other words, he's going to try to shift as much accountability as possible away from the individual and place it on any external factor he can. And he does this so that he can have a clear enemy to fight rather than a hard problem to solve. Because not only is it more fun and easy to fight an enemy, but it's the only way that you can score virtue signal tokens and live out your savior complex. Sonny's doing this with the concept of incarceration too. Despite the fact that Pacific Islanders are committing the most crimes out of every other race in the state, he's trying to shift all accountability, all locus of control to every single external factor he can. It's the police, it's the judges, it's the system, it's racism, it's colonialism, it's the white man, it's it's the Asian man, it's the governor, it's Trump. No, you fucking idiot. It's the individual committing the crime. And the reason this is a tough pill to swallow for neo-progressives is because when you remove the imaginary enemies from the equation, you also remove the ability for neo-progressives to pretend to be saviors to the poor disenfranchised people of color in prison. So... Mr. Sonny Gannadin, until you can demonstrate that Pacific Islanders hold no power at the level of the individual to keep themselves out of prison, then you have no justification for your claims about discrimination. And certainly no justification for enacting significant government action in the name of this imaginary discrimination. Especially when those proposals are also being pushed at the direct expense of the dignity and empowerment of the Pacific Islanders in Hawaii. Neo-progressivism is a cancer to Pacific Islanders, and Sonny Gannadin is a tumor. Which brings me to my final point. That again, I acknowledge that there's a slight chance that it wasn't Sonny Gannadin who left the comment. But even if it wasn't, it doesn't matter. And that's because these people aren't rational actors. They're not formulating their own ideas. They're merely conduits of an ideology that's possessed them. So whether it's Sonny Gannadin, Peter Opus, or any other neo-progressive, it doesn't matter. They're all just different tumors of the same cancer. They're all interchangeable, and they all serve the same purpose, they say the same things, and they're all generic as fuck. And the chemotherapy, the cure for this cancer, are the facts, the evidence, and a little bit of logic. And it becomes increasingly clear that Sonny Gannadin is completely devoid of all three. So thanks for watching, y'all. Take it easy. Stay empowered. And as always, Matima Atonga! Matima Atonga!